Continuing the modular phone saga from our last video, let's take a look at LG's first and only attempt at a modular smartphone. This is the LG G5, and these are its friends. The idea of a modular smartphone was cool, and I don't think it will ever not be cool. Like the framework laptop, where its concealed USB-C ports can be transformed to be a headphone jack, Ethernet, HDMI, etc. This is vaguely the idea that LG has applied to their smartphone, all the way back in 2016. Inside the G5, we have an edge connector. As a side note, isn't it cool that we can see the entire motherboard with one press of a button? With this edge connector, we can connect the LG friends. All two of them. Seriously. LG reused the friends name on a 360 camera and a VR headset, as well as a rolling home camera, but they do not physically connect to the phone. While I will get onto the friends in a second, doesn't that just seem like a wasted opportunity? It would be cool if LG featured some of the same mods as the Motorola, like a projector, or a speaker, or a printer, or even some physical buttons that I could add for games like Call of Duty. But sadly, LG never expanded on the Friends line past the initial lineup. The LG Cam Plus is a neat module in purely theoretical terms. It's a camera grip that gives you a two-step shutter button, a video record button, and a zoom wheel. It's an idea that we've seen photography-heavy phone manufacturers like Xiaomi do in the modern day. You can even buy universal smartphone camera grips. What LG did differently with the grip is by including a 1200mAh battery that can give the phone a few minutes worth of charge. The idea is that you press the shutter to activate it, it's charging while you're taking pictures, and then it stops once you finish. How is the module in practice? Well, the zoom wheel spins far too freely and can be easily activated. The color only matches one variant of the phone, the grip is too low down on the phone to be comfortable when held vertically, and doesn't stick out enough out of the phone to be comfortable horizontally. The battery charging implementation is a gimmick, there is no quick charging via the module whatsoever. Oh, and my unit is dead. I would give LG the benefit of the doubt and blame the 8 year old battery, but even users back in 2016 had dead units, straight from the factory. From the disappointment that was the Cam Plus, let's move on to the Hi5 Plus, which without exaggeration, is one of the best tech purchases that I've ever made, to the point I actually bought a second new inbox one to keep as a spare, that's how much I love it. I already thought that the onboard WCD 9335 DAC inside the Snapdragon chip sounded rather decent, but the friend module really takes the audio to the next level. The base performance is just like of my HTC 10. It's bassy in the sense that you feel it, as opposed to hearing it, and doesn't muddy the instrumentation, which are lovely and sharp. Kicks on 80s Italo and Eurobeat tracks really strike a punch, and vocals are crystal clear, and there's a great sense of separation on well-mastered tracks too. The friend module has a life outside of the G5 too. It comes with an attachment that allows you to use it on PC, Android, and iOS. Although I was getting very poor performance on Android, with there literally being no bass. It was fine on iOS and Windows though. As the Friends modules connect via USB 2.0 internally, it means that Apple Music on the G5 should theoretically be transferring bit-perfect audio, without Android downsampling the quality. So yeah, it's incredibly versatile, and it was worth me grabbing another one before the supply of these dry up. Funnily enough, a Chinese factory was actually repurposing these modules as PC DACs with their own casings, a really lovely way to upcycle. So those are the modules, but what is the phone itself like? You know what? Awesome really. LG generally packed the phones with a lot of features, though unlike the V30, we don't have many of the enthusiast features, like log video recording. But what we do have that we have since lost is an IR blaster, which instantly worked my JVC Hi-Fi and Samsung CRT, which is plain awesome. As well as this, we have an FM radio, a feature that wasn't even all that common in 2016. The phone's final official update left the phone on 8.0 Oreo. I really like the little touches throughout the Hollow S. Maybe not the clone of Samsung's settings page from the Galaxy S5, but still. Like on Samsung phones from the time, we can change the unlock animation, and that changes the lock and unlock sounds, and they're all goofy. The weather widgets are beautiful, and the lock screen has a rain effect when it's raining outside. In terms of specs, the display is a 5.3 inch, 16 by 9, 1440p IPS panel, though curiously, we do have an always on display, which uses a special display controller to reduce battery drain. While the IPS panel would have certainly caused some upset back in 2016, it means that in 2024, we have a panel that is still perfect no burning or discoloration. The physical dimensions are very similar to the 6.1 inch iPhone, the perfect size for a smartphone for pocketability, in my opinion. We have a Snapdragon 820, 4GB of RAM, 32GB of storage, of course expandable, USB 3.0, a headphone jack, a removable 2800mAh battery that you have seen earlier, and 18 watt fast charging, which can fully charge up the phone in about an hour. Oh, and we get a notification LED too, because why not? Even with hardware, LG really packed every feature that I could possibly need, and that's why I love this phone. In terms of build, this phone is made out of metal. Mine is the gold variant, but there was also a black, silver, and rose gold model too. 
The micro dyeing process on the metal does make it feel more like plastic though. We have a fingerprint scanner on the back, as well as dual cameras, flash, laser autofocus and a color spectrum sensor for white balance. Unlike the G4, the volume buttons have moved to the side, with the fingerprint sensor still acting as the power button. Performance wise, honestly it's not all that bad. The HTC 10 I own feels slower than the LG, which I can only presume is either due to software optimization or more likely difference in storage. It's a little choppy, but unlike the HTC, it doesn't heat up massively when listening to Apple Music. It's not a phone that you'd want to use on the day to day, the animations aren't the smoothest on heavier apps, but I am impressed with just how usable it is at the same time. There isn't much to say about the camera, so I'll make this segment short. Although in saying that, this is the first phone with a second camera, if you don't count the HTC One M8 step camera or LG's Optimus 3D, which had two of the same cameras. No, here instead we got an ultra-wide camera alongside the main camera. This is incredibly common nowadays, even cheap phones like the Galaxy A15 come with one. But back in 2016, this was a never seen before feature. How was the ultra-wide camera? Well, it's an 8MP sensor with an absolutely crazy focal length of 9mm. This focal length is so wide, you'll struggle not to get your fingers in the shot. This is awesome! Not only was LG the first to make an ultra-wide camera in a phone, but it's also wider than almost all modern smartphones. How is the quality? It reminds me of the LG V30. It's the classic smartphone post-processing look. It's heavily lacking in detail, and the software is compensating by sharpening the image, to the point that grass and leaves turn to pure pixels. It's the same affair with the 16 megapixel camera, actually. Thankfully, LG is LG, and we have a RAW mode that we can shoot in, and we can make the pictures look so much better than the post process results, it's not even funny. Suddenly, distant detail looks normal, and dare I say, there is actually more quality in the final pictures. It's the same with the ultra-wide photos, they're clearer, plain and simple. However, we can really tell that the optics for both cameras are pretty poor. The ultra-wide camera suffers from chromatic aberration and soft edges, and the main camera looks a little hazy. In terms of colour rendition, they're alright. I like my pictures with more contrast, hence why the edits look the way they do. I noticed the greens and reds are naturally very vibrant. And during the brief bit of British sunshine, I thought that the colours are very nice. They're vibrant, but they're not oversaturated. The biggest colour has to be HDR. Pictures almost always come out so dark, to the point that the pictures are unusable without editing. But of course, with the phone exposing for the sky, it means that we can pull the shadows in Lightroom and get a very natural HDR effect. Far more natural than iPhone's post-processing, without adding in noise. So all in all, you can manage with these cameras, you just need to edit the pictures yourself. In terms of video, we have 4K recording, however there are bitrate artifacts everywhere. The camera hunts for focus constantly, and when walking there is a jello effect from the EIS. You can switch lenses during recording, which is more than you can say for some modern phones, but it will also cause the footage to drop frames. Since of course each module has its own speaker, the speaker quality differs per module. We don't have stereo sound with the G5 sadly, but I have to admit, the stock speakers sound pretty good. Not very bassy, but they are clear, which is the most you'd ask for back in 2016. The Hi-Fi Plus speakers have more bass to them, though some clarity is lost. Pick your poison. In terms of battery, both my original battery and a supposed new battery only last for about 3 screen on hours. But of course, with the battery being removable, all we need to do is pull out the module, swap the battery out and off we go. My unit is the H860, which is the dual SIM model with Taiwanese firmware. What it was doing in the British CX, I have no idea. And likewise, I have no idea what firmware version this is, since almost no results show up on Google. Sadly, this means that even if I was able to unlock the bootloader, I wouldn't be able to run the Android 14 based Lineage OS that is available on the European G5. There's also a problem with the phone disconnecting from the Wi-Fi, which is an absolute pain in the backside, and I have no idea how to fix it, though it's not as bad as when I first got it. It's a shame that LG did not double down on the modules, because it could have been the beginning of something great. Sadly, maybe due to the declining sales of the smartphones, the company just threw everything at the wall to see what stuck. And we can infer that the friends did not sell well, judging by the fact that I paid £1.60 for the new Cam Plus module, and the Hi-Fi modules have been turned into PC DACs by third parties. I suppose though, we can do everything by USB-C nowadays, and people would rather have tight waterproofing than the ability to replace a battery once every few years. But it does make the LG G5 a fantastic DAP, one that will hopefully serve me for years to come until Apple Music stops spotting Oreo. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you for the next one.